All right, continuing where I left off. I was referring to ruminants as being able to digest cellulose, which is rather unusual amongst mammals. Um, the reason they're able to do this is because they have protozoa and bacteria in their rumens, which is a part of that four-chambered stomach. These protozoa and bacteria are directly responsible for breaking down cellulose. And as an added bonus, when those um, microorganisms are passed from the rumen into the um, chemical digesting chamber of this stomach, they are actually digested and their protein is utilized by the ruminant. So actually a significant portion of a ruminant's protein intake is purely from these naturally occurring microorganisms. Okay, moving on, continuing to talk about um, macromolecules, specifically saccharides. So simple sugars and double sugars dissolve readily in water. They are what's known as hydrophilic. So this is a property of these sugars that allows us to make sweet tea and all sorts of delicious things. Hydrophilic, of course, literally means water loving. What happens here is sugar crystals dissociate in water so that each building block is surrounded by water molecules and they are distributed evenly throughout the solution. Moving on to lipids. Lipids, on the other hand, are hydrophobic. They do not mix well with water. Of course, if you try to take a tablespoon of vegetable oil and mix it with water, it doesn't work very well. And it's important to note that lipids are diverse molecules made from various building blocks, but they are not actually macromolecules or polymers. Examples, of course, we have fats as well as steroids. Dietary fat consists largely of the molecule triglyceride. So here we have a glycerol head. A fatty acid tail can be added to that glycerol head through a dehydration synthesis reaction. And here we have an actual triglyceride. Tri refers to those three fatty acid tails. Fats perform many essential functions in the human body. So it definitely gets a bad rap, um, but it's actually very important in the right amounts. So fat is a great energy storage molecule. It also helps with cushioning and protecting vital organs. It helps with insulation. And fats can be either saturated or unsaturated. Saturated fats have the maximum number of hydrogen bonds with carbon atoms. So they are said to be saturated with hydrogens. This causes carbon chains to be straight, so saturated fats are solid at room temperature. An example of this would be butter. Unsaturated fats, on the other hand, have fewer than the maximum number of hydrogen atoms bonded to the carbons. And they have double bonds between those carbons. This causes carbon chains to kink and bend, and it causes these fats to be liquid at room temperature. So most vegetable fats, like canola oil and peanut oil, are liquid at room temperature because they are unsaturated. Here's your typical fat molecule. Going back to that, again we have a glycerol head and we have three fatty acid tails here. This last one is unsaturated. There's a double bond here. There could have been one more carbon thrown in, um, but because there's a double bond there is not. And just for your reference, if a fat 
like this has even one double bond, it's actually going to be considered unsaturated rather than saturated. Most animal fats have a higher proportion of saturated fatty acids. Again, examples are butter and lard, and most plant oils tend to be low in saturated fatty acids, as I mentioned earlier. Corn oil, peanut oil, sunflower oil, all of these are unsaturated oils with plant origins. Steroids are also lipids, but they're very different from fats in both structure and function. The carbon skeleton is bent to form four fused rings. So we have these four rings here, making up the cholesterol molecule. This is the base steroid from which your body produces other steroids. So your body will naturally produce testosterone, testosterone, <laughs> testosterone or estrogen. That's what I get for trying to read two words at once. Um, obviously if you're female you're going to be producing more estrogen, but you're still going to be producing a little bit of testosterone, and it's the other way around if you're male. Examples, of course, the sex hormones, which are testosterone and estrogen. Okay, moving on to proteins. So a protein is a polymer that's constructed from amino acid monomers. Proteins perform most of the tasks the body needs to function. So when you hear the word protein, you're probably thinking protein shake, various types of animal protein or vegetable proteins, but proteins are actually really integral to almost all of the biological processes that take place in our own bodies. So there's many different types of proteins. They're the most elaborate of life's molecules. The four types of proteins, we have structural proteins which provide support. So structural proteins will cause um, your hair texture or be responsible for what type of hair texture you have. Storage proteins provide amino acids for growth, so in berries and other fruits, storage proteins are going to be necessary components. Contractile proteins help with movement, and then transport proteins, as their name implies, help transport substances. An example of this would be hemoglobin. All of the known proteins are constructed from a common set of 20 different amino acids. I'm not going to test you over these amino acids, but this is just for your information. Um, many of these are important components in our diet, and some of them are known as essential amino acids which means that our body cannot manufacture them, but we must take in food that contain those amino acids. So in various combinations, these, <coughs> excuse me, these 20 common amino acids make up many different proteins. Each amino acid consists of a central carbon atom bonded to four covalent partners. So here we have that central carbon atom. Each one of these lines represents a bond. Each amino acid also consists of a side group that varies among the 20 different amino acids. So represented in this model here, the side group is variable. It's yellow. So with leucine, which is one type of amino acid, it has this particular arrangement for its side group. With serine, it has a completely different arrangement to its side group. Cells link amino acids together by a dehydration synthesis reaction. Remember that just occurs when there's a group here that contains hydroxyl, there's another group here that contains a hydrogen atom, 
those two can come together. A water molecule is formed because there are those free components there. And then a bond is formed here in the form of a peptide bond. But dehydration synthesis, all you really need to know when it comes to that particular term is that a water molecule is formed. The resulting bond between these is called the peptide bond, as I just covered. So your body has tens of thousands of different kinds of proteins. Again, protein is not just in the form of chicken tenders <laughs> or any sort of food we take in for nutritional reasons, but all sorts of structures in our own body, as well as the bodies of many other living things, such as this chicken, um, are made up of proteins. So the arrangement of amino acids is what makes each protein different. The primary structure of a protein is simply the specific sequence of amino acids in a protein. So for example, lysine, valine, phenylene, glycine, arginine, etc. These make up this particular protein. So each one of these little ticket-like segments is an amino acid. A slight change in the primary structure of a protein affects its ability to function. And we'll touch more on this when we're talking about genetics, how you can have mutations in the sequence of DNA that codes for a certain protein. If there's a mistake in that process, then you can end up with um, misshapen proteins. So the substitution of one amino acid for another in the hemoglobin molecule is what causes sickle cell disease. See what has happened here is one amino acid has been substituted for another and that is the mutation that's responsible for a sickled red blood cell. So it's important to remember that the sequence of amino acids is really essential to what protein is going to be made and how that protein functions. However, proteins are not found in the long chains as depicted in the previous slide in our actual bodies. It is the protein's shape that determines its function. So we have the primary structure here. Again, that's just the sequence of amino acids. The secondary structure here, tertiary structure, and quaternary structure. So the two most important ones that I want you to know about, just the primary structure, which again, the sequence of amino acids in a protein, and the quaternary structure, which is responsible for the shape of a complete protein. It's also important to note that a protein's shape is sensitive to the surrounding environment. When you have an unfavorable environment, such as temperature or pH range that is not compatible with a protein, it can cause a protein to unravel and lose its shape. And this is called denaturation. So when a protein denatures, it loses its shape and thus its function. A great example of this is when you fry an egg. What you're seeing here when that translucent egg white turns opaque white is the denaturation of the proteins in that egg white. Um, and this is ultimately responsible for um, heat stroke. So if, if a person or animal actually ends up suffering from heat stroke, um, actual damage, including fatality, can occur because the proteins in our bodies are literally losing their shape and their function. Alright, I'm going to pause here and pick up in the next segment.